Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I am Alexandra Terry. I'm the chief curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara. And I wanted to provide a bit of context for the impetus for this workshop and why we're here today. I mean, we're here for many reasons, but um, Sylvia and I started working together um, in relationship to an or a group of people in Santa Barbara called the Environmental Alliance of Santa Barbara County Museums. And that's a mouthful, but it was hard to find out how to encompass 14 institutions in Santa Barbara County, everybody from uh, our museum to Sylvia's Museum at UCSB, to the zoo, the Botanic Garden, um, but really it's a group of people um, who came together in 2020 to combine their impact to raise awareness about environmental issues through focused exhibitions, media campaigns, and educational programming. And our this is the inaugural project for the Environmental Alliance. And the title of the inaugural project is Impact, Climate Change, and the Urgency of Now, which is running from this month, April through to September of 2022. And I am going to throw the um, link into the chat in case any of you are interested, but throughout the next six months, all of our 14 institutions will be taking part in different programs, exhibitions, workshops like this um, with a goal to so, um, you know, educate our community, educate ourselves and come together. Um, through each of the Alliance members' unique exhibits and program offerings, this innovative collaborative will bring a range of disciplinary approaches to education and engagement around the chosen theme, enabling our visitors to deepen their understanding through art, history, science, interactions with animals, and in botanic garden settings. So that is what brought us here today. And I am going to pass it over to Sylvia. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, my name is Sylvia Perea. I'm the curator of the architecture and design collection at the Art Design and Architecture Museum at the University of California, Santa Barbara. That's also a very long title. And our museum is partnering with the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, where Alex um, works. And in collaborating, we're collaborating in putting together this workshop. Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce you to our speakers, who are three women who have played a protagonist role in engaging the museum field with an environmental mission. One that serves museums to fight climate change by means of their operations and educational programs, a mission that transcends the museum walls to imprint change in society. Sarah Sutton is a museum professional with significant experience in environmental leadership and climate action in the cultural sector. Sutton is the CEO of Environment and Culture Partners, ECP, a US-based nonprofit that leads the national cultural sector's national and global participation in America is all in. Under her leadership, ECP also manages two programs, Culture Over Carbon and the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative. Sutton is a member of the American Psychological Association's Climate Change Task Force and steering committee member and climate change co-chair for Health in Trust. During 2021, Sutton was one of the 100 global representatives invited to advise the International Panel on Climate Change, the famous IPCC. She is co-author of The Green Museum and, uh, and author of Environmental Sustainability at Historic Sites and Museums, two books that I highly recommend. Mikaeline Gallagher is the Director of Education and Environmental Programs at the Annenberg Foundation Trust in Sunny Lands, where she oversees public programs and environmental research projects. With degrees in environmental policy, management, and leadership, as well as in art history, Gallagher has served as board president of the California Association of Museums and chaired the executive governance programs and the Green Museums Initiative committees. Gallagher currently serves on the newly formed Strategic Action Committee 
and sits on the board of the International Environmental Communications Association. Among her many publications is Fight Plan, The Birds of Sunnylands, which accompanied a related exhibition at the Annenberg Foundation in Sunnylands. And last but not least, Haley Mellon is a painter and land conservationist from San Francisco, California. She is the founder of the Art Into Acres nonprofit for permanent large scale land conservation. The initiative has supported millions of acres of new locally, fed, locally led conserved areas with a focus on intact forest landscapes, key biodiversity, and deep soil carbon protection. Melin supports carbon calculations for museums and for exhibitions. She has co funded conserve.org art and climate action, and the Environmental Council at MOCA, Los Angeles. Her work has been exhibited broadly in museums like P uh, MoMA PS1 in New York, Bischoff Projects in Germany, and Museo Pino Pascali in Italy. She's also the recipient of a Rizome Commission for the new museum in New York. So thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah, Michelin, and Haley. Um, so just for you to have an idea of how the workshop is going to go, first, the panelists are going to present um, how they have helped museums or their own institutions to push forward their climate plan and statements, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Uh, we're going to use the um, questions that you entered in your survey kind of as a guideline to um, moderate the discussion. So thank you everyone for being here today and um, I will pass it on to Sarah Sutton. Thank you. And oh, whoops, I have to remember to share the screen. Hello everyone, glad to have you together today. It's sort of nice to have this smaller group. It means we're going to have a good chance to chat and talk about real issues instead of polite ones you can offer in a public setting. This is a recorded event that will be shared among the group, but I want you to know that it's nice to be able to just chat with you about what's really going on in your personal experience. I had a chance to read through some of the things that were questions for you or statements about how far some of you might have gone or not gone in all of this work. And before I launch into my lecture, I just want to let you know that it is all good that each of us has a bit of a journey to go on here um, and that it's different for everyone. It starts in all stages. And I hope to illustrate how there are different ways that you can join the journey that's appropriate for yourself and for your institution. So the first slide I'm showing you is my version of a climate statement that might appear on a museum's website. So um, I'm going to read it and it doesn't necessarily come out conversationally, but this is something that might show up on a website. It's not an actual climate statement. It's what I might like to see. So we understand that the climate is warming faster now than during any period in human history. We know these changes are harmful to many, many of us, particularly the vulnerable and the least responsible. We know that humans drive this change by burning fossil fuels, failing to manage waste, mismanaging world lands and waters. The resulting changes have overwhelmed the biosphere's ability to adapt. We know that humans can choose to slow and reverse these changes. We believe that every organization, including this museum, has a responsibility to pursue and enable this work and that we can accomplish more together. This museum is committed to reducing its impacts on climate and calls others to join them in this work. This is how we fulfill our stewardship responsibilities and support our communities. You can imagine that working with a whole bunch of people to hash out that language might be a little challenging. This is another version of a climate statement, which sometimes I wish is all that we would do because it just gets us on the business of this work faster than all the work it might take to create something like that longer one. Climate change is happening, happens everywhere. We caused it, we can address it. Let's get going. And what matters is that we do it together. That's another version of a climate statement. If you were thinking about how to write one at your institution, since we have too few to point to at museums, what are some of the aspects you might think about that go into it? The best I can do is show you what some similar statements are, different issues, but statements on a big issue. 
So this is an equity statement at Old Salem Museum and Gardens. And they talk about embarking on a process of self-reflection and review with the goal to have the organization be an empathetic, welcoming location that represents the needs of the staff and the communities that surround them. As an organization, they're dedicated to equity in economic, pay, cultural, ability, gender, racial diversity, and social inclusion. So it should be economic inclusion, pay inclusion. So that's their statement. And I've bolded some of the concepts in there um, that reflect the way in which we have to approach justice work, environmental work, climate change, human change, human behavior, self-recognition, all of those things get wrapped up in something as complex as a statement that represents your institution and the people who do the work there. So that's an example of um, an equity statement for working with people. This one is about indigenous land acknowledgement. This is at the Abbey Museum in um, Maine. And they state that they're in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. We make this acknowledgement aware of the continual violations of water, territorial rights, and sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. The Abbey is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they share their stories. And those bolded sections in there talk about responsibility. They talk about to whom the responsibility is, the characteristics of the relationship with those people. They acknowledge the things that they have done and the things that might be changed. So that's an important value statement. And this one is about race. So this is a program um, at the, they call it NAMAC, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's about their portal for talking about race. And the section is called whiteness. At the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we believe that any productive conversation on race must start with honesty, respect for others, and openness to ideas and information that provide new perspectives. We hope that this portal will be an ever-evolving place that will continue to grow, develop, and ensure that we listen to one another in the spirit of civility and common cause. So again, you see values, attitudes, respect, responsibility in that statement. Now, if I can move to the next slide. So this is the one that I read to you at the beginning. And I've bolded those things that I feel are important in a climate statement. We talk about who the issue resides to with. We talk about the collective, the we, of how all of us have to do this work together. We say where the responsibility is. We demonstrate that we have a power to make a choice and that this work is going to get done only if we are committed, we join together, and we do this work as a collaborative. So I'm not sure how that will play out in other institutions um, statement designs, but I think those kinds of characteristics are important. There isn't yet a list of all the things you ought to include, and I'm not sure there should be, because the statements will be appropriate for each particular institution in different ways. So how come we haven't written these yet? Well, you probably recognize a lot of these statements here, that we're not a science museum and we don't do climate, that it's complicated, too hard to do. Climate has changed before. Maybe the scientists don't all agree. Both those things are irrelevant. Um, and it costs too much. I don't know how much to do it, how to do it. Do you know how to do it? The consultant will surely cost too much. Those are all things that I hear regularly. Uh, and you shouldn't believe them. We don't have to know exactly how to do this work before we start. We only have to start and figure it out. And you'll recognize that some of the things I say in here were reflected in that statement that I read before, that the solutions come from continuous learning. Abbey Museum said it's ever evolving. It talks about their value in discovery, innovation, critique and improvement. We are learning institutions. We 
find all of those things, the sorts of things that we'd support among our learners, our visitors, we'd want to pursue ourselves. That's what climate work is, is figuring it out, learning more and sharing it with others. You probably won't get it right the first time because this is innovation, research, exploration, and learning, and that is okay. So call it a pilot, then you don't have to get it right. I just know that learning together as a group makes all of this work easier. Climate change is a system. It, climate change is systems change, and it takes more than one brain in order to sort through all the aspects of it. So why not do this work together? Because if we don't, we'll really be sorry. So I just want to give you a few last words about how you might say to yourself in those moments where you're feeling a little frustrated, you're not sure what to do next, or you are thinking maybe you should have done something different or something more. Just start where you can. We do that with those folks that come to visit our museums or join us for our education programs. We meet the learner where they are and then help them move forward. Why not do the same with yourself? What is available to you and your department, you and your job, your museum at that time? What's currently available to do and start there? Little goal is just fine, but measure the results, monitor it. Give yourself a little bit of a scorecard so you can have a little bit of a pat on the back and know what progress you've made and point to it to show people that change can happen and that it works out for the better. And then do a little bit more. The secret of all this is not that anybody knows particularly so much more than anyone else. The secret is that this is addictive, that once you start doing the work, it gets more marvelous and you will want to keep trying to do more of it. Just let that happen to you and it'll carry you a long way. And that will give you the opportunity, the courage to create a plan to do more and to ask your museum to create a plan and do more. Sometimes they have to watch you doing it and then copy you. Uh, and sometimes they just start doing the work with you. So when you get started, some of the ways you can think about managing it is just to keep it simple. Chunk it into something that is reasonable. These are the things that we've done so far. We use both sides of the copier paper or we've put up a solar array. This is what we've done. Now, these are the things that are on the list we're doing. And then those other things we haven't started yet, they are just in the future. So when someone says to you, it's not enough to reuse paper, you should be putting up a solar array, you can say, we've already done paper, we're working on this now. The solar array is in our future. We can't accomplish it all now. It is all right to chunk it into bits and tackle it that way. And it's all right to take the opportunities that are presented to you. We are taught to plan in a straight line, to work according to a list or a schedule. And we feel like if you just do the thing that comes by, then you're somehow not really being thoughtful. Well, sometimes the thing that presents itself is the next best opportunity to create change because you don't have to convince anyone to do it. The opportunity has arisen right there. If there's an open door, go right ahead and take it. And then celebrate all the bonuses that come with it. So let's say doing that NLED project saves you money while it saves you energy. It's not bad that it saved you money. It doesn't have to be done only because it's good for emissions. The fact that it saves you money means that you can now do more work for your museum, spend the money on more green things. So when there are lots of other benefits that come with it, accept that as if that was part of the plan, because that's usually what happens with sustainability work. Good sustainability works creates those co-benefits. And while you're at it, be fair to yourself. This can be hard work, but it's also joyful, hugely rewarding work. So no one's gonna go all green at once, but you can get started. Take those baby steps, build those muscles, build the brain power, skills and abilities to tackle the next thing. And when people see you doing it, they're going to find a way to try. And the more that you do, you're going to feel more capable, courageous, and competent in doing this work. So I want to leave you with one last quote. Let go of the guilt. It just interferes with progress. Give yourself credit for what you're doing. See what everybody else is doing and give it a go yourself. 
and have an awesome time doing the work. Thank you. Oops. I think that was my cue to tell Micheline she could start. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I think you have to unshare first. Okay, that's it. There you go. I think I can share now. All right, and slideshow. Okay, can you see? Okay, um, the last place you want to be is following Sarah Sutton in a climate talk, <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> So um, I'm from Sunnyland Center and Gardens, and I'm going to do a very quick introduction as to who we are because no one knows who we are um, in a lot of in a lot of areas. So um, this is the winter home of Walter and Leonor Annenberg. Our site's 400 acre historic estate. Um, it's likely the most iconic house in America after the White House, based on visitation and events that happened here. And today, the site also includes a new visitor center, a desert gardens, an administrative campus, and just under 200 acres of undeveloped desert. So in our desert, we do, we, at our site, um, I wrote our first acknowledgement statement for programs that I was doing. It has now made its way to the website. It wasn't on the website. And I want to explain how we do ours and why. Um, this I did because in our desert, the Kahuya people are still here. They're part of our community leadership. They're in fact part, in fact, parts of the desert, including Palm Springs, is owned in a checkerboard pattern by private owners and the tribe. So um, it's a very blended area for that. We have a population also of significant indigenous members from Mexico, Central and South America as well. Um, so we acknowledge all who may be in the room at the time because we focus on solving world issues and creating space for communal discourse. Um, at our programs, I also acknowledge the Annenbergs because they made an important choice. That was to keep the property available in an educational public trust rather than turn it over to private ownership. And they left it with a, a significant endowment to support the work we do. So right now, this is who we are. Um, this is a list of some of the areas that we're players. And we have to be aware that the decisions we make and the efforts that we do uh, affect every area of this organization. So it meant that when I got here, I had to be very creative in how I pursued a sustainability mission. And it also meant I needed to be patient. Priorities um, with a new institution we just opened in 2012 um, really uh, had a lot of conflicting areas going around. So trying to get sustainability into the conversation took a lot of patience um, and a lot of time. What we did know and what I was able to make clear was that the public expects transparency. So once you recognize that, you don't have to flub your way through this with green bling or play the look over here type games. Um, and that are not, it wasn't gonna be effective for us. So we took a risk and we chose to be transparent with what we were attempting and what we were struggling with. I was doing garden walks for up to 200 people who would show up um, and had to explain to them what we were doing. And they're coming from a variety of backgrounds that did or did not um, approve of some of the things we were doing. If we did too much on the green side, there were people who objected. If we did too much on the um, non-green side, there were people who objected. But that was never a reason to not begin the process. And this kind of, my, my best day at Sunnylands was a day when um, I, I call him the MAGA guy and he showed up for one of my garden tours. He was old man with a cane, red suspenders and a nice bright red MAGA hat. And I thought, oh, good God, here we go. And I was very concerned about how that was going because he stood front and center and was laser pointed on, at me. Um, we still went through the whole garden walk. I did it just as I usually did. I said, these are the things that have been successful. These are the things that are not successful that we're still working on. Uh, and at the very end of it, um, I asked for questions and he was the first hand that shot up. And so I, here we go. I said, yes, what can I, how can I help? And he pointed his finger at me and he said, you're a fanatic I could work with. And I thought, this is the best day because never did I think that I would be able to at least get somebody who I expected would be completely not in alignment to at least hear everything that was being said. 
So we address three areas of challenges that we have, sustainability, historic preservation, and adaptive reuse. And that's because we are a Philadelphia designed estate that is um, in the middle of a blow sand desert. We have historic preservation of a major architectural um, site uh, with the, one of the largest mid-century modern um, buildings or private homes in existence. And we also have adaptive reuse. In that home is art collections, uh, furniture that um, the, the intricacy of that furniture used to be done by hand. And there's only one person in the United States that still does that. And we have adaptive reuse. So we allow the president of the United States and any of the members going through these retreats and meetings that we hold here to sit on that furniture that only one person will know how to fix. So in that, every time we do something at Sunnylands, we have to look at all of those three and we look at them from whether we're gonna hold the line, are we not gonna move and do anything that's gonna mess with that? Are we gonna move the line? Do we need to move towards sustainability or adaptive reuse in that case? Or are we gonna abandon the line? That's something that we are going to lose on. We, we aren't gonna be able to do it. Um, now that doesn't mean that we will never be able to do it. That means we are, in my opinion, always doing it in the moment. So if you talk to people about that and you think about those type of processes when you're trying to figure out how to frame wording, what I've discovered is the public is incredibly forgiving. They understand the struggle of this. All they want is transparency. They want to know what you're doing. Um, and you also need to be sure that your organization as a whole is in agreement with this or understands what you're doing. So to figure this out, you can always do a core values type workshop. Before I talk about that, though, the reason we had to do that was because, um, and why I think it's so important, is eventually if you don't take any position, it's possible that one will be selected for you. And that's what happened at Sunnylands when I first got here. This is our coexistence statement that we designed specifically for coyotes. It's another place you can start by making little steps into certain situations that you want the public to know you've taken a position on. But it's now being reworked into a bigger wildlife state, um, statement because we now have bobcat on property. We have a significant bird population here, over 168 documented birds, species. And this year we have our first um, great blue heron rookery. Um, I did not know that even though when I came to Sunnylands, we had installed all the lead requirements, we'd put hundreds and thousands into this site, but we hadn't clearly defined what we were about. I was in a meeting and our director of operations at that time said, um, we need to trap or re and re quote unquote, remove coyotes on the property per city demand. Um, I objected in, and in the course of the conversation, it got to the point where he just looked at me and said, whose side are you on? So our core values clearly were not in alignment. Uh, long story short, this became my first project uh, before I even had the title of environmental programs director. We did the right thing ultimately, um, but the city wasn't super happy in the beginning and um, they, they really wanted the coyotes gone. Uh, the country club next to our site immediately began a 10-day snaring program uh, and declined any public education meetings on the issue. I had to be cautious back then because we were a new cultural center um, and we were going head to head on a major public issue. But today we are very public with this statement. So what was risky in 2012 is not risky in 2022. And that's something else to remember as you're moving forward. What is no now may not be no later. So that was 10 years ago. And just last month, that country club's HOA announced that due to pressure by its membership, they will cease snaring and interfering with the coyotes on their site. So 10 years of patience did pay off. So how do you start? core values. There's a lot of different ways you can do this online. Basically what it is, is it's having all of the staff at your site select words that they wish related to your site or they believe relates to your site. It's kind of like a word cloud, but then you turn it into a statement. If you do not include the entire staff, you're looking at a leadership set of core values. And that's really important to know because that may not be owned by the entire organization. You have to ask everyone. And if you're, if you're considering excluding some staff, you need to rethink why you are deciding to do this. Because if you're afraid you don't have buy-in, then you don't probably have buy-in. 
and that will need to be fixed before you develop core values. You need this to be a core value statement for your organization. You will also do this probably more than once because the core values that would have come up in the 1980s are not the core values that we would have now, but it's a good activity and can exp expose some weaknesses as well. Here's ours. This hangs on the wall in all staff areas. It's over time clocks. It's over drinking fountains, anywhere that someone might glance at it to remember um, what the core values are. And it's um, Sunnylands commits to excellence in all aspects of its work, values diversity, encourages collaboration, and acts with integ integrity and transparency, strives to be a leader in implementing environmental responsible practices, embraces the future with optimism, enthusiasm, and creativity, and builds on the Annenberg's legacy and makes a difference in the world. We also did a green vision statement. And this is another thing that you can start to do just to get yourself moving. It, can, it doesn't have to be a binding or not. It can be a binding or a non-binding um, green vision uh, statement. This helps get everyone comfortable with the concept before you start looking at targets. It can be specific or as general as you want. It can be aspirational or pragmatic. It's a statement to the public of who or what you want to be as an organization related to climate change and sustainability. Don't avoid doing it because it's not perfect. These statements can be updated over time. Do what you can. Each time you come up with something, you've moved the line. And I find most often when I'm talking to organizations, they don't do something because um, it's it's not big and because it's too big. They do something out of, as, as Sarah said, guilt that they're not doing enough so they don't do anything. And don't ever let that slow you down. So you can also grab it by topic, which is another thing we did. We just launched this last year. I spent two years going through all of our documents and collecting all of our water decisions that we had done. And, um, and so now we created a page where our staff can go if they're not water experts. We have um, three different landscape designs on our property. And so each one has a very different water management challenge. And so now when guests ask them about it, if it's too deep of a question, they can send them to the website and we have the conservation for the historic estate, the center and gardens and the administrative campus. So if you click on either of these, you'll follow our water story on a particular part of the trust property and all are addressed chronologically by date of opening under three different areas. Landscape, which is physically the what that is there management, the technology, how we handle those spaces, and practice, the philosophy or reasoning behind why we made our choices. So going back to where we started, um, what are the three things at your site that are all priorities and yet they can conflict? One of those should be either climate change or sustainability if that's what you're working on. And then just start to move the line. And... That is it for me. So. Thank you, Micheline. And now we're gonna move on to Haley's presentation. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Hope you can hear me fine. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to listen to uh, two people that I have a lot of respect for to speak. And I think as Sarah began quite eloquently, something we all do together. So it's fantastic that you've convened this afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> My work as an artist engages carbon emissions <clears throat> uh, for climate reasons, but also because um, I focus quite a lot on land conservation and carbon is part of our land cycle. It's what our trees are made of. And uh, it's what uh, is stored underground in our sub subsurface fungal networks. So I became quite interested in carbon, came a little bit of a carbon nerd. And um, over the last few years have supported institutions galleries, art studios, shipping companies, publishers, in doing their first carbon audits. My interest is only to support once because there's so many people to support, um, but I do do this pro bono. So if anyone listening would love these services, I'd be happy to provide them. I recently received a wonderful grant from the Teeger Foundation uh, to support some of the back office work. 
And so we're going to continue that um, into the coming two years. Uh, today, my interest was to enable <clears throat> your curiosity for carbon emissions audits, um, taking that from a place of curiosity to a place of actuality. And the reason we uh, do a carbon audit or a carbon report or carbon calculation, they're all the same thing, um, is to think about our carbon emissions. And carbon as a gas in a gas form is one of our waste products, similar to sewage or trash. Um, it's the one of the few waste products that we actually don't clean up. So we are emitting quite a lot of it. We still have the first emissions from the 1800s up in the atmosphere. And we're emitting it at the rate of, I think, 36 billion metric tons a year. I mean, as a global community, quite a lot. Um, our atmosphere is actually really, really narrow, beautiful little blue band. Uh, it's only 12 miles high. So we're putting quite a lot of a very spacious gas into a very narrow space. It causes, um, causes heat, causes pressure. And so that's one of the reasons we have shifts in our weather. And climate as a word is defined as long-term weather. So when we start learning about carbon emissions, we start changing some of our practices. And that's why you do a carbon audit. Um, so the process for one is really to, and that's what we're going to review here, is really to decide what you're going to calculate, calculate it, look at the numbers, the results you got, and then reflect how you can improve and lower your emissions. Um, and then lastly, to compensate or protect or draw down or offset whatever term you're looking at using uh, the carbon you did release. Um, so today I'm just going to go through some of the resources you have available to you as institutions and um, and, and also just look at like, what is that process in more depth? How much time does that take? How much does that cost, et cetera? Um, and I think one of the things you're gonna find is it's actually a super friendly process. Uh, it is very inclusive. A lot of institutions are doing it for the first time. And I've been supporting a range of US museums in doing their first carbon audits. And one of the things we find is like, break off something easy the first time, like do an exhibition, find a single artist, do an exhibition, maybe it'll take your staff like two to three hours um, to pull those numbers together. And you'll you'll learn quite a lot. Um, so prior to looking to audits, I'm just gonna show some of the resources. If you wouldn't mind like re-enabling me to um, share a screen, that would be great. Okay. So here's some different resources available to institutions. I'm going to start with PACT. Um, one of the things you'll see from PACT, which was just formed last year, is that there's a bunch of different initiatives, nonprofits, organizations in the arts trying to support institutions in their sustainability. And so this is a great site to visit. Um, everyone also, the reason we created PACT, like, okay, everyone is to show that everyone agrees, that we're all agreeing on the same targets, that there's not different agendas. It's mostly just coming together under the Paris Accord, looking for a 50% reduction by 2030, transitioning to a zero waste sector, because actually waste uh, emits quite a lot of CO2 when it um, biodegrades. And looking at intersectional environmentalism, inclusiveness within the community, and sharing knowledge. So you'll have different partners. I co-founded, I founded Art to Acres and co-founded Art and Climate Action. And it's just sort of lists the different institutions and organizations that are partnering. Um, so great, great web page. Uh, welcome you to looking at it. Um, this is our website. We keep it pretty minimal, but mostly Art to Acres focuses on a large-scale land conservation on behalf of institutions, galleries and artists, primarily artists. So we'll work with a few artists a year and they'll donate an artwork. And one artwork will conserve often somewhere between two and 4 million acres of land. So it's quite an interesting um, transition in terms of value spaces, uh, but also institutions will conserve on behalf of their carbon drawdown. Um, and the first institution we ever had to do that was uh, MCA Chicago with the Mika Roddenberg followed up by Guggenheim Ram Coolhouse, and I think we've worked with around 35 to date. Uh, Art and Climate Action is our local California sustainability art support. It's San Francisco centric, but it's also Los Angeles. Uh, new group, uh, we formed it about a year and a half ago. Also the recipient recently of a Tiger Foundation grant, and so it's gonna have its first staff member, which is awesome. Um, there's also another group called GCC, uh, Gallery Climate Coalition, that's based in Los Angeles. 
and I helped found uh, that branch and they're just about to get um, fiscally sponsored. Uh, our takers is gonna fiscally sponsor them. They're gonna have staff members in the coming year. Um, my internet might go out, so I'm just gonna speak quickly. And then lastly, uh, artists commit where artists sort of join and commit to their, their, their drawdown percentages. One of the great things about GCC is there's a calculator on it. So you can calculate your emissions. You can do that yourself. You can do that with my support, et cetera. So now I'm just gonna switch over and look at some sample carbon reports or carbon audits. <clears throat> this is one I did with the carbon accounting company for all of MOCA. And one of the things we found was let's start, let's make a baseline. Let's see what we are, where we are now and then figure out where we're gonna go for 2030. So in making the baseline, um, this is sort of what it looks like when we presented it to the board. Um, what is the scope of the study? We're gonna look at all the whole institution, all the offices, all the storage. Uh, we're gonna look at you know, fuel, electricity, transportation, et cetera. And one of the things we found, I'm just gonna fast forward to the end of the report, um, is that the majority of MOCA's footprint was in scope two, was actually electrical to chill water for cooling the building. And so that means if we took care of that scope two problem, we've already surpassed the museum's Paris Accord goals. And we obviously wanna go more than 50%. Um, and so with that knowledge, the museum applied for the Helen Frankenthaler Climate Initiative that Sarah Sutton on this call um, oversees and advises on, and we're bringing that museum into solar. So really it shows like cause and effect, right? And that's that's why you do one of these carbon audits. Um, but that was a bigger one that took us a year, whole institution. Here's a simpler one. This is a draft form. Um, so you're just sort of looking at it in process, but I'm working on this with the ICA Miami and this is for an, just an exhibition. So they wanted to look at the Shakaya Booker show. She's an uh, artist that's not based in Miami. So the majority of their um, emissions were, were shipping. And um, this is sort of, once it's formatted, will be what their board receives. Um, again, this is free to the museum. And so they were happy to move into it. The staff loved engaging. Um, and one of the things we learned with this is because the, there was so much on shipping, they've now shifted to a policy where they don't ship individual artworks anymore. They wait for a bulk of artworks to come together. They ask like friends and family, like in Los Angeles or shipping friends, hey, can you hold on to that for a while? And then they ship the bulk all together rather than sending transport every time an artwork becomes available. So that's a major change. Um, moving forward, this is the first uh, carbon audit I ever did, which was for the Rem Cool House at the Guggenheim. We only had a very little bit of time. And one of the things you'll see with this, this is just very bare bones, um, was that they actually had quite a lot of shipping. They had 237,000 pounds. They shipped more than half of that by air. So they had a massive footprint because of this air travel. Now, as you know, with Rem Cool House, none of that is like fine art. None of that had to go by air. And they planned the show over five years. So one of the shifts that the Guggenheim made is they started to look at what do we actually have to take off the ground? And with that, I want to cite um, the or 2019 show by Gary Hume at Matthew Marks. Um, he required the gallery to ship it by sea, required. And the gallery was like, no, no, no. And he said, you have to, it came from Europe. And so they shipped it by sea um, at a 96% reduction in carbon emissions. And uh, it only took, it was much cheaper. It took two weeks. Um, lastly, we're gonna look at the David Zwerner audit, uh, just a part of this. This is for the Harold Ankart show, it was a show on trees. And um, one of the things we saw there, it was, it was the amount of the footprint on the building. And did that building in New York is not very well insulated. So they're starting to look at their insulation, look at their skylights, windows, et cetera. Another thing you could see from that is we actually, we were working with more detailed calculation with this show and also a Mark Bradford show. And if you're, you have like materials like a Sinelli oil stick, um, wood frame, and that just didn't have a big impact. So materials from the studio don't have a large impact, but it's really your, how you're uh, shipping something the resources you use to pack, your travel, um, any concrete, like any sort of built uh, material, and then and then the building footprint itself. Um, so that's sort of an overview of carbon, of what carbon reports look like. The process is um, rather simple. You talk internally and you say, we wanna do this. We're currently in a voluntary carbon market in the United States. So you can, um, you can, you can calculate what you'd like to. 
other countries, it's mandatory. In Colombia, you have to pay a fuel tax. Every time you pump petrol, a liter of petrol, you're paying a fuel tax, and that goes to their nature fund. Um, states, we have yet to institute a mandatory carbon tax. And in the interim, companies are trying to have best practices, institutions are trying to have best practices. And you decide, we're going to learn, we're going to tax ourselves. And so you um, have to select what you're going to. Um, lasso or what you're going to calculate. Usually an exhibition, again, is a great place to start. And you're going to start with like, okay, we're going to calculate our travel, our shipping, um, maybe some materials, some different aspects. You go about that. And then you, you do the calculation. Again, I'm happy to support it. GCC is a great calculator. Sometimes we partner with carbon accounting company when there's a bit of funds available. Um, and you return with your carbon number for that exhibition. And you um, use that time to reflect as a team. It, it doesn't really matter if one doesn't reflect, you really have to reflect to have impact. And you decide, okay, we're gonna change these, these core things. You don't have to change everything. There's a few things that make a huge difference and it's really enjoyable. And the staff we find, especially like younger staff just get super into it. Um, so it's really fun. It's a very inclusive process. And how much staff time, again, I said it takes like maybe two to three hours for a simple audit, 10 hours for a more complicated one. You can do it after the fact of having an exhibition, before you have an exhibition, anytime you have the information. So you can go back and calculate an exhibition from 2016 if you have the metrics. Um, if you wanna think about what kind of metrics do we need, go to the GCC website and just click on their calculate page and you'll see what you'd have to put in. Um, you can also put in information and save those pages. Uh, and you're welcome also to contact me and I'll be happy to do that manual labor for you. So I think that's what we have today on carbon reports. Um, they're really fun. And that's all I got. Thank you so much, Haley. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you to Sarah and Michaelina as well for their presentations. And we have questions here prepared, but we would like to invite our participants to join the, the floor and, and submit questions either in the chat or please unmute yourselves and pose the questions directly. Maybe I can start with a question just to kind of get the ball rolling. And first of all, I wanted to thank our speakers. Just, I mean, the work that you're doing is so admirable and I feel emotional hearing from you and um, I'm just so grateful for everything that you're doing and, and for you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, and, you know, one, one question that has been on my mind throughout this entire process is that MCASB is a, is a small, institution. We have a small staff. Um, we really do a lot of, of <laughs> everything ourselves. I mean, shipping involves us renting a U-Haul often and driving a short distance to pick up work. But um, when I think about the larger concerns that I have, which are, you know, we were talking about this Werner building. I mean, I think that our, our building is quite drafty. I feel like, you know, we have an issue with our HVAC system, our lighting. However, we are housed within a greater building. So we are actually within a, sh a shopping center in, in Santa Barbara, downtown Santa Barbara. And they recently, the shopping center recently underwent a, a huge um, remodel. And with that, you know, everything was LEED certified and they were required to do, um, go through, you know, a lot of work to make sure that everything that they were, um, incorporating in their new building was sustainable. However, when I think about our lighting grid or when I think about our HVAC system, it's, it's less accessible to us. So as a small institution that is housed within a building that is not an art museum or a cultural institution, um, and also as, as an institution that I feel is already taking sort of daily steps, you know, we are, Sarah, what you were testing, mentioning about the copier paper, or we're really trying to switch to bamboo materials or more sustainable materials when we have events. I'm wondering what the kind of mid-range actions that an institution like us can start to take before having to, um, you know, petition the city or the larger retail system that we're within. Um, Sarah, did you want to start on that one? 
but I'm going to start with a question, but thank you. So mid-range is that complexity, impact, cost, or all of the above? Certainly impact, but all of the above. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, if you created one of those charts where um, on the, let's see if I do this right, on the vertical arrow, going up is price. Horizontal arrow, going to the right, is difficulty. And you end up with four squares. You can put all of your projects into, this is easy, but expensive. This is easy, but easy, uh, but inexpensive. And you can look at a whole chart of a bunch of things and see where there are clusters, where things are, you know, somehow naturally go together and support each other if you did them. So that if you did a few of those things together, they'd be easier and have greater impact. So just want to caution you that choosing one is usually all that's available to you. But sometimes an easier path is to look at what a variety of options are and see which ones support each other. And then all of those are easier together than any one of them would be on their own. But if we wanted to rank of what might be the next thing, uh, just like Haley was mentioning zero waste, if we can think about zero waste, which has lots of complexity, but you can pick, some, pick a part of it to get started. Zero waste has a significant impact and is still manageable through steady tweaks at your site. So let's say you pick the next special event. You're going to test composting or changing the um, silverware you use or come up with new sourcing so that it's all local and have a plan for any unused meals, have a place to go to the homeless shelter or to another location. So waste, if you're not doing an energy activity, I'd find a waste one next. What do you think, Haley? Yeah, I mean, that that's, that's the idea of composting is a, is great is a great one. I mean, we're our staff is small, but you know when we have events, we could have two hundred to four hundred folks, and I think mean, that's that's a really exciting idea. Yeah, I think from from recent experience, the things that seem to be doable, mid level, exciting, and affordable. Uh, one was a museum shifted to all vegetarian meals, especially for like little events, like when you do catering. Um, they also shifted their caterer to like a biodegradable, you know, the caterer has like biodegradable materials. They don't bring a lot of plastic forks. Um, they shifted at the same time to reusable glass glasses instead of plastic at openings, having a giant water jug instead of bottles. So like someone just got excited about food and that shift mm -hmm. happened. Um, I think composting is really great because also staff can bring their own compost in if you have like a city compost system. Um, and that can be like a compost hub. Uh, and a shift that we're looking at right now in the Brooklyn Museum is a shift to um, just all LED lights. And so I think they will apply for a Frank and Dollar grant for that. Um, another shift was actually just a more conscious when they are upgrading their HVAC system. Like sometimes there's already equipment shifts that are gonna happen and you just like focus on um, renovating with like sustainability in mind or you're doing a big paint order and you order a less toxic or hopefully non-toxic paint substrate. So sometimes there's just like constant purchases and purchases are a great way to enunciate an interest in sustainability and also change your footprint at the same time, often changing the well-being of your staff. Uh, I think, you know, from the experience of like the freeze art fair, they shifted from regular fuel to biodiesel and they dropped their footprint by 63 or 64%, I think. So sometimes again, just like ch changing up your energy. I, I find the biggest impact is changing up your energy source or how you're fueling your buildings. And um, I feel like a spokesperson for the Frank dollar, but one of the things that they enunciated is also a big, can be a big savings. Um, so that's helpful. And then lastly, I think, um, you know, doing some sort of introspection on shipping is, is highly, highly impactful. Anytime anything leaves the ground, whether you're FedExing a book 
or FedExing a painting, anytime anything leaves the ground, you're going to have a much, usually times 20 carbon footprint. Um, same thing with people, you know, just try to take one trip and stay there longer and do a bunch of meetings all at once rather than going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we saw that in the Annika Yee report for the Tate Turbine Hall Commission. It's like, there was just so much transatlantic travel. Um, and in retrospect, there could have been less, right? Mm -hmm. I would add um, something that we've done at Sunnylands, um, and it came out of, it, it seems to always come out of meetings. Somebody makes an announcement that something has to be done. And then we're kind of like, hmm, we had been storing um, cases from an exhibition and they had been stored in a space that suddenly in like zero time, they decided was going to be shipped to another use. And so it was announced that those things were gonna be tossed. And these were, you know, um, really beautiful cases. And um, we just sa said, give us a month and we'll rehome those. And we immediately got together a list of all the cultural sector, um, museums, historic societies, schools, um, all of that. And we said, um, we put it on collections to give us all of the specs on it and take photos. And within one email chain going out, every single one of those was homed. Uh, and so they didn't go into the landfill. And so that, um, and in fact, they went to one institution that had they not received those, they would not have been able to do an exhibition that they were wanting to do. This was that last piece of their puzzle that we didn't know they needed because we, we don't talk to each other. <laughs> and, um, and it made a big difference. And that launched this bigger thing. Um, we have furniture, unfortunately, the Trapunto type um, repairs that it needs have to be done across country. So the furniture has to be shipped there and brought back. But all of the cases that it came in, in um, when those got broke down, our operations team said, we'll break them down, we'll put them on the trailer. And then I had to tow them over to um, a local arts organization who picked through and took what they wanted. And then the rest actually went to a gentleman who lives out in the desert and he builds homeless shelters out of scrap and stuff like that, that people can break down and take with them if they move. He builds these one room type things. The rest went to him. In fact, he is now living in the desert from doing that, um, not living in a house. And so that one project went to two locations. Um, and so this has become a pattern with us that the one thing that I would say is the risk when you don't have institutional buy-in. So like Haley said, the younger staff get involved. If, if it's run by a passion person, if you start something that somebody who's just passionate about it is gonna take on, what happens when they leave? And so the concept is to get this as an internal natural process. And it isn't, it wasn't as hard. I, I got a little nervous when I started doing it, thinking, God, what am I taking on? This is going to be quite the undertaking every time we do an exhibition. But now we we've gotten to the point where we talk about it when an exhibition is being designed. So what are you going to keep for something else? And what's going to need to go somewhere else? Um, and what are we using to make them? And so we also cut our carbon footprint because we have the people who want it come and remove it right from the site. We don't move it to another location and store it and then take it to them later. And we're doing this baby, we're baby stepping through that. Um, there wasn't really a big model for us, but those types of things you can do um, and, and just thinking it through and having the institution say, yeah, that's going to be a priority for us. So let's take the time and have the patience to go through the process, because I find that's what's lacking. Sometimes people just want it to go away. We're done. We need to move on to the next thing and getting people to take a breath and say, okay, it's not going to, our timeline is not so tight that we can't make these good decisions. Um, is also helpful. And that's a, the, to me, that's a mid-level thing because it is a significant amount of waste. It's a significant amount of travel. Um, and so that might be something that you think about talking about as an institution. Thank you. I mean, that's super helpful. And, and Michalina, I, I love that you brought this up because Sylvia shared with our Environmental Alliance group the other day, a website for posting you know, exhibition material to share. And it blew my mind because as a smaller institution with, you know, a, a, a pretty small operational budget, we also have a lot of items that we 
would make an exhibition for us or make it possible. And I think, you know, if there's one thing that I have learned institutionally throughout the pandemic is that there is, you know, there's a desire for collaboration more than we allowed ourselves to buy into previously. And I think this kind of conversation, I mean, we don't want to waste, we want to support each other. We have this material. I think that's just such a brilliant, oh yeah. And Sylvia put that website in the chat. Um, and then we have a question in the chat, which is primarily for Haley, but I think she dropped off the call. She may mm -hmm. come back on, but um, I was wondering if you could speak to your experience in teaching and training staff around carbon audits and carbon awareness. And this also speaks to Ms. Gallagher's comments on culture and shared visions. Well, while we're waiting for Haley, um, I can tell you that, um, for Sunnylands, the, the, the vision for sustainability came from the staff. Um, it was something that a couple of us came in at first. We've gone through three iterations of sustainability committees trying to get it right. That's, probably, I think, probably one of the hardest things that I hear from institutions, and it was for us, too. Um, it's a hard thing to figure out where to start with that and how much power you have to make decisions and to implement them. But um, for us, it was learning how so i came up through um work through uh wildlife rescue through some of these more natural areas and i lived in places like north carolina who were not always on the same uh, did not have the same core values <laughs> that i might um and i was also teaching and and talking and touring when um, evolution was not a word that you could use in some communities communities so i learned very quickly how to say things without using the words and how to get people to be more receptive to listening. So I could say things have changed over time and, and this animal has been designed to work very well with this plant and things like that. And they would hear that. And, and so that's sort of my strategy. And, and you know, there's times when those people who do more of that soft talk and talking about values and those systems and aren't going to like hit people over the head, we've come under some heat for that of no, you need to be stronger, you need to say more. And, and I don't think that's always the case. And don't sideline or other people that are in your organization who you have already decided are not going to have those core values. Because what what you have to determine is what's the end goal do you, and, and what i find sometimes with people that are extreme activists is although they want change they really want someone to tell them they're right and do you want someone to tell you you're right or do you really want to get things to change and and that's a hard thing to negotiate sometimes. And so for me, I know there's a lot of um, activist movements out there and they're doing great work. What I want to do is be able to connect with people who aren't listening to that. And so that means listening to them. You know, what are the values? Um, and those, there's a lot of research to back up success in some communities where they've gone in and done that work, where it's about addressing the community by values, not getting them to acknowledge this is how it's going to be. And um, when I worked at the Living Desert, I know they were, we were involved with the, um, the Mexican gray wolf and returning that species to the wild. And that was a really struggle process because, and a lot of it was due to communication and the lack of good communication with the communities in which those animals were being put back in. So I think from that, um, I just sort of started migrating towards, let's just keep people coming to the table. And once there, you have to have something for after the march. You have to have an idea for after these things are happening, where do you go? Um, and so that's kind of how I address it with staff. There's some staff that are like, eh, okay, that's fine. Um, and we just start moving through that. Okay, so what's your problem with this? And what do we need to do? And, and it, it does work. Um, you have to have those conversations and you have to listen and you can't shut people down who are questioning what you want to do because then you can't give them the answer. Thank you, Michaeline. Um, Emma has a question and then Natalie, if you want to go ahead and pose it live. 
Sure. Yeah. And I'm, um, I'm just so for every, so everyone knows I'm uh, at the San Luis Obispo Museum of Art on the central coast of California. And one of the things I think about a lot, um, particularly uh, as a curator is that, you know, I would say 50% of my job is traveling and most of that tr includes traveling on airplanes. Um, my director also travels quite a bit. Um, and I wonder if, and you, you may not have answers to this, but I'm thinking a lot about how to sort of start to minimize some of that travel um, and thinking about ways to, but there's, there's suspects, particularly when you're working with living contemporary artists, there's something that's so special and so important about being in their studios live and that, that creates such a difference in, um, in the exhibitions. Um, Alex will um, identify with me there. And um, so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts around that, around the, the travel piece that I know for um, a lot of people in the arts, especially in the fine arts, um, it's such a big part of our jobs and our responsibilities and whether you have thoughts on either how to offsite that or um, other ways to think about having those engagements. Haley, I think you should just run with this one. <laughs> if I can um, be so bold. I think that there's, I think a lot of it's just like haste makes waste. So sometimes you're gonna work with this uh, artist in St. Louis and maybe you never go to St. Louis. So you have to make unique trips. Um, and in those cases, you know, especially when you're curating an exhibition that has a three year curation period, you might think, oh, I need to check in often. Um, but I think just trying to, again, like go and be really clear with them. Like, hey, we're trying to have a certain carbon number that we hit with our a ceiling with our travel. And so I'm gonna come and I'm not just gonna come for the afternoon, I'm gonna come for like three days and we're gonna have a few conversations and we're gonna go deep. And then we're gonna do a lot of Zoom. And then I'm gonna come again, like right before the exhibition, right? Versus this, like this feeling, sometimes we travel out of a feeling of like, that it's rude to not show up or it doesn't show that you're like interested. And so if you just verbalize like your process, they're also gonna really respect that. Um, so. I think that, you know, handling it in a manner in which you, it's not like you're absent, but you're clear and you're conscious as to like why you're taking the steps you're taking is effective in that particular scenario that you lay out. Um, in terms of something where maybe you're looking at a city like Dallas or New York, where you do go there more often, I would just... <clears throat> hesitate to do the thing that we do where we're polite. We're like, oh yeah, I'll come next month. But then you realize, oh, I'm actually gonna be in that city like two months later or a month later. So trying to um, just haste makes waste, like just plan a little bit more and try to like bulk those, tr those trips and make the trips like more significant um, versus like a quick rushed studio visit. I think everyone enjoys that. I think also with the pandemic, we saw so much can be done on Zoom. Like Sarah and I have never met in person, but we talk often and I feel like I know her and phone calls, Zoom, emails. Um, there's so many different ways we can connect. So also like virtual studio visits are really great. Like, okay, show me the stuff, you know, and they take the phone around and you get a sense of it. They share images, but I, I think it all just comes down to you communicating to them. Like we have an agenda here and I haven't seen it go, go poorly. I've just seen people kind of relieved. Um, when, when I brought up this, the example of the Tate and the Guggenheim, those two shows that were audited, I mean, the curators had could not believe the number of trips. Like it was like 50 round trip transatlantic flights for like these shows and I think they just like they're paid to do their job they think they need to show up etc so um, I think it just comes down to communication and you planning ahead Natalie thank you so much thank you everybody um, for putting this on thank you for aggregating all these amazing resources and sharing so much today I'm um, so glad to be a part of this, uh, just witnessing. And I uh, <laughs> wrote kind of a long thing, but I, I work with the Europa Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Um, we are going, they are going through this constant process of trying to figure out how to really best show up for communities that they have displaced um, in this rematriation process and changing narratives. I think they've done um, three significant audits around the, the issues that you all have been talking about regarding um, infrastructure, travel, those kinds of things. And they, they're working on being a more sustainable 
lower carbon footprint in, entity, and they've been doing that for um, a few years now. And I, I wanted to know if it was possible to talk a little bit more about like the sustainability piece as it relates to community, um, climate racism, uh, individuals disproportionately impacted by climate change, and how, how to begin to address that in a plan or within action items. Um, from from museum perspectives, and I think I think all of us have answers to this. Um, I've seen a few different shifts. One, um, Mocha, I'm sorry, Mama PS1 did a survey of trees in their vicinity, and one of the things they noticed is that they were in sort of a, a space where there were just no trees, um, and it tends to be proportional that as income levels go up of people who live in a zone tree population goes up. Um, and one of the reasons is that when you plant trees, people tend to congregate underneath them, or like, as we call it, loitering. And so often around MoMA PS1, there were no benches and no trees. And so they started to look at how do we regreen this area? And obviously when there's fewer trees, the temperature during the summer is also hotter. So you get into this sort of cyclical heat suffering pattern, and, um, and it tends to be in poor communities and non-white communities that you have this um, scenario. So that was one response. Um, MOCA in Los Angeles formed an environmental council that funds exhibitions by BIPOC and um, local communities that are uh, adversely, disproportionately adversely affected by environmental pollution and, and, and sort of looks at those issues in those exhibitions. Um, but I do think that what we started with, with carbon, you know, that's a big part of this because carbon uh, is what's heating the one of the one of the elements that's heating the planet. And when um, and climate change, as we know, is going to disproportionately affect global populations that have less resources and that are poor. Uh, so it's part of our civic duty to uh, mitigate our emissions and to lower um, our exhibition emissions for all, not just for like the people who live around us or the people in our country. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm just in full disclosure, I need to say that I'm coming from an organization that has an endowment. So I've been a nonprofit my whole career pretty much, and this is a very different experience. The Annenbergs left enough funding for us to, um, that we don't fundraise. And so what I've discovered and is um, that anytime I have a chance to talk to somebody that has the means, I try to convince them to leave an endowment instead of leaving things to their kids. <laughs> because what this has done is allow me to leverage that um, into working with organizations like Raices Cultura, where um, their executive director can curate. Um, it's, a, it's a very high level local art community um, that deals with um, using art and, and methods to get ag kids um, opportunities. And these are all agricultural kids who left the desert, went to Yale, Stanford, Princeton, and came back and created this organization. I can step away from the curatorial side. I can fund it. Marnie then can select the artists let them help them curate their story. And then we give them the space to do that and they get paid full prices for that. And they tend to tell a different story than we might be telling at Sunnylands from an Annenberg centric um, experience. And that now has moved to a lot of other programs where what I can do is fund and give voice um, to community members. Um, we were able to ho host um, Dolores Huerta here with Richard Montoya and a couple others. And so these types of um, opportunities, I've never had at an institution that I've been at before, but this is, and it's also allowing that that organization, she's able to get more creative. It's one thing she doesn't have to think about. This is, she can just do this project. Um, and and it, it's escalating even, even more than that. So our, our garden draws a lot of public and it draws a lot of public that might not see these organizations. So I think another thing you have to be aware of is um, being able to set ego aside of wanting to curate everything and wanting to have your hands in everything. 
and be willing to give space to other groups to get them in front of people who might not see them otherwise. And listening to both of those conversations, I think about how I don't believe there's a magic answer for any of these questions. Um, but there are characteristics that are the same for environmental justice as other climate work. You look for where there are opportunities to improve things, to benefit more, to create those co-benefits like McLean is talking about. And you look for those opportunities where the things that you need to do, you need to make sure they don't add to the harm. We won't fix everything, but we can certainly stop making it worse. And then where there's opportunity to leverage benefit, to step into those spaces. And if we think of, since you've just heard a leveraging example, I'll give you a do no harm one. Um, I am looking into how you would use um, backup generators with clean power so that when they're running after a disaster to keep your collection safe or to create a cool space for the public, um, that it doesn't pollute the atmosphere at that time. It doesn't make global conditions worse. And in talking with the folks who designed these hydrogen-based um, systems, he showed me a map of New York City where all the diesel generators, the non-clean, non-biodiesel generators are located. And if you map that to where disadvantaged communities live, it'll be a lot the same. So changing the way we do our backup energy in that case is also a more just approach to solving a climate issue. So I'm not sure there's a, a way to do it, but there are ways that we can do better. And that's another layer in your choice making for each time you take advantage of an opportunity to do things better. That also reminded me that one other thing that I wish museums were better about was collaborating in a way to share um, systems so that not everybody needs cold storage, not everybody needs to build these. If, it would be done thoughtfully in a collaborative manner. There's ways in which you could get around those things. And so I think that speaks to it as well. Um, that it, as soon as you said generators, that started me <laughs> thinking on that. But that's something else that I would like to see is finding a way where museums can be more communal in that way. Well, I'm really glad that you brought that up because one of the aims that Sylvia and I had was that this would create you know, we received so much information today that I think will be just, just invaluable, but we want to create a network amongst all of us and continue to add to that because I think, you know, we all have our own experience, we have materials, perhaps we're based in the same city, we can share generators. And really what we want to do is, is once this conversation ends is to start a way for all of us to share this information. And um, the California Association of Museums has also offered to support these our actions by creating a directory on their website for institutions that have written either a climate statement or a plan. And that will hopefully be one hub. And Sylvia and I will kind of get together and, and create something more, whether that's an email group or, or um, I don't know, a Google Drive or something to contain this information. But I. I just admire you all for being here. And, and like I said, I'm grateful for the conversation, but there's so much more we can continue to help one another with. Um, so thank you for saying that, Nicolene. Um, and I echo um, you. Alex's um, words. I'm absolutely appreciative for the encouragement. One of the recurrent concerns that appears in the survey that we have sent the participants is how to maintain the morale high, how to engage our staff, how to engage our board, how to reach out to those sectors in our community that can support the development, not only the development of the climate plan and statement, but actually to implement it. How can we uh, transfer those wishful um, desires of becoming more sustainable into tangible actions? So I wonder if you have some final thoughts on um, how to get more people on board in 
you know, really in regard to your respective experiences. I'd say two things um, that modeling the work usually leads to other people trying as well. You know, doing the thing instead of telling them uh, is often very effective. But also that there's this strange emotional behavioral thing that the more you do a thing, um, the more engaged you are in it, the more you can start to feel good about it and competent in it and you want to try it again, more curious about it. Action leads to engagement and inviting somebody to go with you, to try it with you, maybe to fill in a small gap can just give them enough of a hook that they start to feel more encouraged. And I will tell you absolutely for sure that I did not know I could do this stuff when I started. And that it is only the doing that has built up the energy and interests um, and courage to do it. Because if I let my brain tell myself, it's like, I would have, I would have stopped <laughs> because it seems so complex and so hard. But doing it uh, creates its own momentum. Absolutely. When I started here, I did not think I would be where I was today. I wasn't sure um, that there would that I would be able to get any buy-in on this to push it forward. So if that's where you're at now, um, patience and just keep pushing forward each time, just a little bit more, a little bit more, um, and you'll you'll have a big win in there sometime that will keep you going. I think also communicating what you do as you do it, like communicating with friends. I've seen, like we did a, something with the, the Kunstmuseum Bonn and then they put it on their like website and then the Hans, Hamburger Kunsthal like reached out and they wanted to do it. So I think just one of the biggest carbon impacts or climate impacts you can have at, um, and awareness impacts is, is, is by sharing what you're doing and also sharing in a humble way, like, hey, we're just learning. And it's really interesting, it's fun. Um, to do it, to believe it. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, thank you. I want to thank everybody here today for their participation. And again, we will share the video with um, others. So um, we will edit it in a little bit and make it available for others to follow. And we look forward to maintain the contact and, and, and keep all looped in, into um, you know, as we progress with uh, the development and implementation of our plans. So thank you all. Um, Alex, if you want to wrap up. Um. I, I'm just, again, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly do feel more excited now. Like I just okay. feel this like bubbling up of, of um, motivation and, and I feel, you know, I just, I'm so grateful to you, Sarah, for like this, like, let's relieve this guilt. Like what, what, we shouldn't be acting out of guilt if, in anything that we do, but let's do this because we're passionate about it. Something that's meaningful to us and we can help each other. So we thank will you. We really appreciate being your guests. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank, thank you all. I'll see you soon. Bye.